Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Legendary Accordion Festival. My name is Terry Cavanaugh. I'm going to be your host today, and I'm so pleased to bring to you the legendary Carl. <laughs> Welcome, Carl. Welcome. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm so excited to get to talk to you. Now, I am too. <laughs> I don't know if you know this. You're one of my personal heroes, actually, because oh, of no. what you've accomplished and the uh, obstacles you overcome. So we're going to share that story in a little bit. But let's start. Let's just jump right into accordions. I understand uh, that you are like, and I, actually, I don't understand it. I know you're a big promoter, a big proponent of the accordion. Tell me, how did that get started and what's that all about? Um, uh, well, I, I grew up with no accordion awareness, no polka awareness, or really not very much um, awareness of international music at all. Um, in Texarkana, Texas side, northeast corner of the state, uh, there's a lot of great stuff going on there. Scott Joplin is from there, so there was, and there's a you know a strong rhythm and blues kind of influence and rock and roll. And when I was growing up, it was kind of a hillbilly country it was popular and rock and roll and top forty. And so, um, but when I came to college, um, I would start to hear well, just because I was driving around. Den I'm in Denton. And so the University of North Texas, I went to NTSU actually, which was North Texas State University at the time. But my station picked up a lot of the, the Tejano stations, the Tejano music. And so I started getting familiar with a sound that I was really digging. Uh, but, and I would watch, um, uh, on Saturdays, there were shows like uh, Johnny Canales and uh, Fiesta Mexicana and, some of those and so I just was going wow I don't know much about this instrument I've known of the accordion I knew kids who had to take accordion lessons I knew quite a fit of quite a few of those kids uh, I had to take piano lessons and actually some of my sometime I had to go to piano lessons before uh, school I'd go like take a piano lesson at 7 30 in the morning that sounds so I think I had a lot I think I had a lot of the Feelings about the piano at that time that maybe a lot of the accordion kids thought too, you know, oh God, what a drag. Obviously it was a good thing to do. But um, so when I was in college, uh, I would come home to Texarkana and oddly enough, of all, of all places, I walked into a Woolworth store downtown on the Arkansas side of town. And there was a ton of uh, uh, cutouts, all kinds, but mainly it was polkas and, and accordion music, just that all accordion music. Uh, so uh, I was intrigued and I knew enough about polka, but it was still that, that, you know, the polka was the, always the music that was the butt of the joke, you know, and the accordion also was the instrument that was the butt of the joke. So just like most people my age who grew up mainly listening to British rock and roll and British invasion music and Beatles and Yardbirds and all that stuff. Uh, you you couldn't avoid that being the the uh, information that was given to you that polka and the accordion were jokes, and so um, I was intrigued by all these record albums, and I I thought, well, the jackets don't look anything like rock and roll bands, and some of them are really unusual looking to me. So I bought a ton of them, uh, took them back to Denton, started listening to them, and. Uh, man, well, I mean, what can I say? It, I started uh, wondering why it was it it had such a bad reputation because some of the stuff was just beyond fantastic, and I, it just really grabbed me. And I had been going through a thing too personally, where I was trying to become the <laughs> become less judgmental about everything. And I was just observing things around me. And I thought, wow, people's personal tendencies to judge is actually putting up walls between them and learning. They just immediately put up these walls. So like someone who says, I don't like country music, you know, like, wow, that's a pretty broad spectrum. <laughs> like there must be something more to it. So I, just fell in love with the music and fell in love with the accordion. And that started me wondering like why, 
why it's why is this why is this music and this, this instrument treated this way and that was so obviously i decided wow there's something totally messed up here and the a lot of people that would dig this music simply don't have a chance to hear it so i eventually about a year later i decided to put together a band to bring polka music and the accordion to audiences who generally mainly don't ever hear it and wouldn't hear this, what I was hearing. And that's it. That's the beginning. And then it just took off. And what a takeoff it was. Mm. So I, what I failed to do was mention that you are the director and uh, I guess originator of Brave Combo, a Grammy award-winning band. And uh, besides that, Carl's quite the ethnomusicologist. He's very informed about all kinds of music and he has a big perspective view of what's going on. And that leads me to my next question. What would you say is the state of the union for the accordion these days? Uh, well, my, my point of view is a little skewed because I pay very close attention to it, but I do know that I personally witnessed the accordion when we would play in the beginning if we were playing to, which was most of our audiences in the beginning, were not uh, people who were geared toward um, any kind of music other than what they listened to all the time. And so, um, and I don't want to just say polka music because we played a lot of other things, uh, but the accordion was always the, the core instrument. You know, at least if we didn't play the accordion in that particular song, we were in, inspired by the accordion, you know, for most of the music in the, in the early days, whether it was polkas or whatever. Um, so I, I saw the uh, reputation of the accordion go up and up and up and up, at least in the, like the punk music world, uh, alternative music world, the uh, music world where people were approaching the music from a conceptual point of view more or from an art, mate, like from an idea of an artistic point of view, or from a uh, contemplative point of view, or from an experimental point of view. I think the accordion became a very exotic thing. Mm -hmm. So I soon was seeing the accordions everywhere. In the hippest bands had accordions, and I, you know, the list of bands now and the list of musicians. And but what I did find is that a lot of them as I know about myself, weren't particularly good at it, but they were getting the sound and they were getting the feeling and all of that. So I don't know. I mean, I think the accordion is doing pretty well right now. And, I, and, and from what I've seen in all the ethnic uh, circles, especially around Texas, uh, the whole accordion Kings thing, that, and, and the, the young people, I mean, we play the Ennis Polka Festival, West, West, uh, West Fest every year and the National Polka Festival every year in Ennis and young bands now like crazy uh, are playing the accordion. I mean, when we started playing those festivals, there were no young people. <laughs> it, it, all the bands at Ennis and, and, and all the festivals were, I mean, I remember some great players, at, but everything was kind of a march tempo. It wasn't like, it was not, wasn't a lot of kick to it. And a lot of the bands were really kind of, they were doing well, but it was, it was just kind of stuck in a time, it seemed, you know? And so I think the times have changed radically. And the accordion now, if, and what I've seen really for the last 20 years, if someone's playing it, if people perk up and in a positive way, people want to hear it. Mm -hmm. It's still exotic to a lot of the population. Yes. It's great news for all of us uh, professionals that count on for a living. Oh, so. Yeah, I mean, you 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 have to have benefited, oh yeah, over the years to a growing interest in in just the accordion, if not the music, but the accordion itself. And you can actually play. You're actually a really good player. So when someone who comes and watches you, they're actually learning something. They're hearing something. Yes. Well, I was a contrarian investor. I was way early on the trend. <laughs> Well, I envy people who I envy people who actually learn technique when they were kids. Yeah, yeah, I was I was very fortunate there. So tell me, uh, I'd just like you to share with our folks out there why is music important? 
why is music important? Yes. <laughs> like music. music. Yes. Oh, well. Hmm. Wow. Um, well, let me, from a personal point of view, music is a language for me that's very easy to run through. It's every, for me, music is an easy language. It's always been an easy language. And so it's an exciting thing for me because it's, it's a way to express yourself that you don't need words. Uh, but it's also, for me, it's, it's just a way I can, I can uh, communicate quickly. I can uh, think of things and express them on a piano or whatever and get the point across pretty fast, even to people who don't know much about music. Mm -hmm. So I've always looked at it as another language. Mm -hmm. And I see as I've gotten older, that's how I've always seen it. It's just another language that doesn't have limitations on it. And um, I know when we were both starting out and discovering audiences and experiencing the difference between being background music and something people were actually paying attention to and putting more of their brain power into. I always hoped that uh, for Brave Combo that we were to some degree opening people's eyes and ears and making them more tolerant and making them not make snap decisions about stuff. Mm -hmm. Because as I've looked at, this is, this is going off a little bit, but as I've looked at the history that I know of Polka and what I've lived and uh, the accordion, um, people are, are tripping themselves up on both sides all the time. And uh, I wish that people would just trust the language of music more without everything that gets attached to it. Uh, I've, I've always felt like, uh, and this, this is kind of on topic, that Brave Combo has tried really hard to not be influenced by any of the nationalistic stuff or the ethnic pride or any of that stuff that's attached to the music. We've tried really hard to avoid it. And it's, it's music we, we won't, I mean, and this is, you know, this is just us, but we never agreed to wear any clothes that reflect any event we're at. Like, we, this, is, this is it, this is what I wear. No matter if you see me in a Czech, Polish, German, whatever, this is it, nothing else. And the point isn't that I'm, I am lazy, but the point isn't just that. The point's all, and nobody in the band bends to any of that. Plus, I, mean, I don't eat meat. I don't drink. <laughs> you know, I mean, I am just, I'm very left wing. And I found that a lot of my audience over the years is not in line with me politically. And, um, but it, it doesn't matter most. I mean, some of that does, but most of it doesn't matter as long as everybody's focus is on the music and the power of an obetic or the power of a waltz and that thing that you can experience as a musician that no one else can when you're playing something and you have hundreds of people responding to you rhythmically through their dancing. I mean, that feeling of connection, Oh man, that's why I do this. That is why I get on the stage is I want, I want that experience. And when you can do it, you can, you can feel it. And I guarantee you, everybody's feeling it. Everybody that's investing their, their time and energy into connecting with you, as long as you've got a good rhythm section. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes, I do. I uh, so, God, I don't know. This, ain't, this isn't even the question you asked me, but kind of is. It kind of is. We're getting great content. It's, it's all good. All good. Okay. So I was going to ask you a little bit later on, what, where do you find your fulfillment in music? And you already addressed some of it, like uh, just the connection with the audience, that type of thing. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and, you know, too, I mean, back to what you asked, like, I think it's really important that nobody in our position buys into the hype. And it's really important, like one thing that makes me bristle 
is when people, their reason for doing what they do is they want to share the greatness that they're creating because they're creating greatness in their mind. And their motivation is, oh, I want to share with the world. Well, m most likely what you want is a bigger audience and most likely what you want is more people to show up, what you, what you want more people to buy your t-shirts and your CDs or whatever. So first of all, let's be honest about that. You know, the bottom line, we like a packed place more than an empty place. So I think it's okay if you, your ego has to be there. Otherwise you couldn't get on stage. So there's has to be something there that's making you do it. So you get past those kind of base Neanderthal things, which is the ego, get on stage and then make, you know, make your magic. Uh, but I do, I do try to, like when you were asking why, why music is important, um, I think people should always put the music and the art before anything, before even doing it because you're benefiting somebody. That's great. But don't make that your point. Don't make your point being that you're doing it because you're sharing the gift that God gave you. I mean, that'll make me stop listening almost <laughs> if someone is expressing that because mm -hmm. it's wow that's the only way you really got to have substance why don't you just let your music i mean just play your music mm -hmm. and let the feeling you have just come out you don't even have to attach anything to it you know right now look some of our folks out there are going to be uh wanting to they play already out in public public on some kind of venue or they want to, and I know you have some unique feelings about uh, how do you look at an upcoming performance? What is your mission there? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm, I actually have some rituals to a degree. Um, I generally, before I perform, I don't like to mingle with people, uh, and I do like to get to the space when you do the sound check and all of that. I do like to feel the space, and I, I will automatically think, at that point, okay, is this set up well for controlling the audience? Is this all set up well enough so I can, we can, I can have the most impact possible? And then I start looking at um, if like how <laughs> how good the production looks. Like if you walk on a stage and there's wires everywhere and the stage isn't clean and someone set up the PA and there's just wires everywhere and um, I'm hoping that there aren't any obstacles between the music and the people hearing the music. And there's this big question mark there. So I try to exert as much influence as possible in getting the quality of the show up as high as possible, you know? Uh, but, um, the main thing is just don't be intimidated by it. You know, if you just go for it. Um, nobody in that room is going to be, well, I'll put it this way. Everybody wants you to succeed. The audience wants you to succeed and they want you to be willing to go out on a limb further than they're willing to, but they react quickly if they see that you're not comfortable. Mm -hmm. So just try your best to just let that go. You know, I mean, think about the nights when you're, when you guys were playing the best, it's probably like we find that the, like our best nights for playing is sometimes when the it's like an, an impossible night crowd wise. It's a Wednesday in the middle of the Midwest and we're on tour and we've only played this place once. Almost nobody's there but a handful of people. And it's so Super Bowl I, night. I'm sorry. And it's Super Bowl night or something. You know? Yeah, man, <laughs> you, you give up pretty quick. <laughs> it's good to give up. It's good to like not care. And then everybody really everybody starts nailing it suddenly it sounds as good as it did at rehearsal <laughs> yeah yeah there's something about that over control idea oh yeah that's counterproductive it, it always is because you're too you're too self-conscious so you've got it man you know you have to strike this balance between the per, between being the person in charge who has to have his or her act totally together and the person who can somehow turn that off and not care at all. So you can actually play those things you've been rehearsing and you can actually nail those lines rather than fumbling through the lines. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you play something and you nailed it, 
oh, that's a good feeling, you know. It's like that's another level for you, you know. Right. I mean, that's that's pretty that's pretty important. It really is. It, now, now I'm asking this for me, not even the folks in the audience. I'm so curious about your line of thought about this. What other tips do you have about getting in that kind of flow? Um, well, I really believe that you've got to believe in it. You can't put the fact that you want to be on stage ahead of the fact that you love what you're doing. And that has to show that just, that has to show. So just be sure that you're believing in it. I mean, we're, we're pretty hardcore about, uh, we only will play a song either that, I mean, if it's something that's essential, like the chicken dance, mm -hmm. you know, we are going to figure out a way to make that ours. I just not going to just do a throwaway. So if we're doing the chicken dance, rather than it being a throwaway, we're going to make it the biggest chicken dance possible. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you've heard us, we, we play it in a minor key, mm -hmm. which it works perfectly. So you can start it out when you start. Just that itself, if you put the oomph into it, man, people flock to that. It's like, oh, exotic, different, you know. But I mentioned, I think I mentioned we were talking the other day, the perfect thing to warm up a crowd, no matter what it is. Is just tell them you're going to do the twist in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> just get it in there. Mm -hmm. Get it in there. And then as you get closer, you show them, look, even I can do this. There's nothing to it. Seriously. And people start laughing about it. And then you say, all right, it's time. <laughs> we're doing it. Whether you know it or we're doing it or not. And, you know, you found this that, man, people, I think people want to, get involved and jump in and not feel self-conscious and just let it go. But good God, the weights on everybody and myself too. I mean, I can't just, I can, there's a lot of things I have a really hard time psyching myself up to do. I need to go do some caulking in the bathroom. Oh my God. I've been putting this off this whole uh, quarantine. I thought I was going to knock that out the first week, <laughs> you know, I don't know if I'm going to get, be able to get up for that. But with music, man, you just got to do it. You got to believe in it. And I would say focus on the stuff you love and don't, don't, don't placate ever, you know. I mean, you got to do some things. When you do the Oktoberfest, there are some songs we, we, and I want to do because it's part of the whole thing. And I just want to play them in a way that's intriguing, you know, like a lot of the, modern Oberkreiner stuff. Like we've been working that in for our, our Oktoberfests where the polka is the more the disco beat, mm -hmm. you know, rather than the polka beat and which was shunned a few years ago and nobody's going to play a polka that way. And then, wow, there's some cool stuff coming out of Europe. That's polka, but they're doing the disco beat, you know, and I, I kind of want to do that, you know? And so a lot of the Oktoberfest stuff now is kind of the old style polka. And then a lot of that Oberkreiner, it's kind of a, just a disco rock beat. Everything else is the same. Mm -hmm. And I, I really dig that kind of chicka, 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 like, this is like hyper bellow shaking. Yeah. That's a lot of the uh, modern German stuff, the accordion stuff that's like double. I don't know if they're doing that electronically. I, I simulated the best I can. My bellow shaking is actually pretty decent. It's actually, it's all right hand. Da, 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 you really, that's yeah. how you're, that's how you're doing it. Just attacking. Uh, yeah, I think they, they seem to be right on top of the keys. I'm kind of like, got my whole arm going back and forth. Da, 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 da. Yeah. Well, it's, a, it's a cool thing. You know, I mean, I love what people discover to do on the accordion or they've heard this comes from some, tradition and it, it, we're just being exposed to it you mm -hmm. know anything new like that gets me pretty excited i always it, it feels like you you found gold or something a, you know a new treasure like wow exactly I, I try to explain that i mean imagine if you didn't know accordion and polka and you just stumbled on i, I don't know how much 25 to 30 albums and i take them home and it really felt like that that's exactly how it felt each one i opened 
was a treasure chest of new stuff. And pretty soon you're hearing some of the best stuff you've ever heard. And man, these accordionists, I mean, one of our, the first uh, accordionist I really listened to is this uh, Swedish guy named Andrew Walter. And he was popular with um, uh, this guy named Walter Erickson. Now, Walter Erickson had more popularity in the United States, but Andrew Walter wasn't very well known. They were on this uh, label called Colonial. And th there were a couple of their records in that first batch. And everything was just perfect. And so when we started the band, without a doubt, I wanted, a couple of I wanted to learn a couple of Andrew Walter uh, polkas. Right. And so we, we got really close. I remember we were listening. <laughs> One day we were rehearsing, we would record ourselves on a cassette deck. Then we'd go into another room and listen to it and go, I, I, what, what are we doing wrong? You know, it's, we're not, something's not right here. <laughs> and I remember the day we, we got close and it was, wow. We're, we're actually, you know what, phenomenal, a phenomenological approach is to try to capture the essence, like mainly the essence. And I don't think we knew that's what we were doing, but I think that that's what we've realized we achieved, or at least from a brave combo kind of ragtag perspective. Uh, but um, every one of those had some influence on me, you know, and the, the Tejano, all the Tejano stuff down here. Uh, the, I, eventually I discovered uh, Steve Jordan. And then that just, in terms of accordion, just flipped me upside down. And I just started just consuming that as much as I could. I, I know a lot about that guy. <laughs> yeah. But, Let's go down that trail. Like, uh, name, name uh, three more of your, Top, top accordion players. Right? Oh, wow! Well, that's well, without a doubt, Guy Klusevic. You know who um, has been a friend for a while, but before we were friends, uh, man, oh man! And I mean, I gotta say, um, Danny Jarabic, without a doubt, uh, from what from his background, but the how much he's let especially Steve, but, but uh, that mixture of the, the Dutchman, the upper Midwest Czech Bohemian stuff mixed with the really edgy Tejano music. But people like Tejano, the Mingo Saldivar, of course, Flaco and Santiago Jimenez, uh, Ramon Ayala. Um, uh, oh God, I mean, we, we can go on. Oh man, uh, Eddie Rodick the Slovenian accordionist. Mm -hmm. I just love that guy. Uh, 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 Joey Miskelin and um, uh, you know, Terry Cavanaugh. <laughs> uh, oh, well, you know, the people, you, I mean, seriously, I've, I've sat at the edge of the stage many times and, and marveled at your, your precision and how, also how well you lead, lead a band and control an audience. Uh, but um, Ted Winklinski, uh, I mean, uh, with uh, Molly B. Ted Lang. Uh, yeah, Ted Lang. And um, uh, yeah, and Alex. <laughs> Mix, Mr. Alex, Mr. of course. <laughs> and uh, we got an up, and I'll, um, just giving us a plug here for the rest of the week. We, uh, some of these names actually are going to be here in the festival uh, all this week. And you're going to be able to see them if you come on back, uh, including Danny Jarabic and that Carl mentioned and Alex Meister and Ted Lang. Now, we've got an up and comer coming. I don't know if you've heard of him or seen him. His name is Michael Bridge, but he's yeah. a phenomenal concert player working on his uh, doctorate degree at University of Toronto right now in accordion performance. Yeah. Yeah. You, um, you mentioned him to me, and I've checked out several things. And at that, and that brings up the whole electronic accordion uh, thing, which that's a whole different world, mm -hmm. you know, because then you're, and so his proficiency with that, I don't know if that's a Roland. Does he play a Roland? Uh, he plays both a Roland, and now there's a new, new version coming out from Bulgari called an Evo. And oh, that, I've heard of that. Yeah. And it's... Uh, Sorry about this, Roland. It's a little bit more uh, 
it's just another step up. It's got the the uh, engine basic basically of the Roland, but it's a wooden accordion. So you, even the sound that's being generated in there gets a little reverberation. It's a little warmer and mm -hmm. some other upgrades. To I, you know, I mean, if we're speaking frankly, you know, mm -hmm. I have a, a a Roland accordion which I I like and I like some of the sounds. The thing that I found is that it's the bellows are strange. Mm -hmm. It's I different. Isn't it? I don't know what it is. It's not bad or good for me. It just feels like it has a bounce back that you've got to learn to control. It kind of flops differently mm -hmm. than a real bellows. Yeah, it has this strange. I don't know what it is. Uh, and I've learned to use it, but it it I had to almost approach. That's why I was saying uh, I think they're different critters, uh, and they're kind of they're they're unique. Uh, because you have to adjust to all that stuff. Yeah, and I forgot to tell you, we've got Roland as a sponsor here. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I was careful to say it's just a matter of taste and from personal experience. I bought one. I have one. I use it. So, okay. uh, but that's just you know, uh, I can I can tell you some things I like about one of my uh, Telecasters that I don't like about another one of my Telecasters. Too, Fair so. enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, listen, I, I want to think about. Uh, maybe leaving our folks out there with one last parting gift. Uh, what would you just say to folks that don't know how to play the accordion, but they've always wanted to, and they're here tonight listening to this conversation. Um, you know, it's not that they have to be an Alex Meixner or a Ted Lang, but just the enjoyment of it. Have any thoughts about that? Any I do actually. And um, it's not an exciting one. But because it's, it's where I, I wish that I had done and I would do, I would tell if you really want to learn it, learn the technique stuff, learn how to do stuff, you know, get your bellows smooth, learn how to play without looking down at your hands, <laughs> you know, learn how to play precisely. Um, I, that's what I would say is get those get all of that technical stuff out of the way or at least do that as you're learning simple songs. I, I, I wish that I had come into this with more proficiency because I've had to learn the songs and learn how to play from the same starting point. Mm -hmm. And some of my habits that I learned from starting like that uh, or have hindered me because I didn't learn the best way to do things. And it's taken me years to get around to where, oh, that's a better way to do this, or I'm doing this wrong, or I wish I had built these strengths earlier. I wish my left arm was stronger, you know, and that I'd started doing that at a young age. So that's not exciting. And, you know, like I said earlier, just, you know, uh, believe in what you're doing, love what you're doing. Yeah. And I, and I want to go back to, to Danny and Ted for a second, just cause I want to, I want to, and, and Alex too, um, all three of those guys, sit in with with brave combo but i'll tell you if if ted lang or danny jarabic or alex meister is at the edge of the stage and i go oh y'all know Mr. Lou? <laughs> like yeah <laughs> it's our whatever uh hey how do you know that uh that it's kind of that brahms uh hungarian dance number five? Oh yeah i know that all right well we do like a polka version of that so oh yeah i know that song and so when when you're talking about players like those people the it goes so far beyond the accordion their brains their abilities to conceive all of this and it's so cool to be to I mean, it is i just love it god because first of all i go ted take a solo <laughs> man he's playing the best solo i ever heard you know i'm just laying back and getting to enjoy this and i've actually experienced those so and let me say one more thing too. I have a, a a Roland keyboard that I play all the time, a Juno keyboard, and I have a Roland synthesizer. That's my favorite new toy. So, thumbs up to Roland. <laughs> all right. So tell everybody how they can find more about uh, Brave Combo in case they aren't fans already, but right. they're interested. You can email me directly, Carl at BraveCombo.com, Carl at BraveCombo.com. Uh, or just go to our website, uh, go to our Facebook, and you can find, but the community, you can reach me directly. And that's the best way to do it. 
just by email. But bravecombo.com uh, is the website and Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of that's the same as everybody's. So check us out. We're giving everybody a teaser out there. We've got an album coming out for Brave Combo in a few months, right? That's right. Oh, sooner than that, I hope. I've only been working on this three years. <laughs> no, it's I'm doing videos. Uh, it's it's fin I'm picking up the finished master audio tomorrow, and um, wrapping up. I'm gonna hopefully we're gonna be launching the clarinet polka video that we did with our um, guitarist. Um, uh, Robert, uh, just uh, you're not going to believe it. I mean, the on the guitar. So it's quite a sight. Robert Hocamp is quite a player. Great, great. Y'all check him out. You'll love it, I promise you. And come back and see us because we have these other great accordion legends that we've mentioned here tonight. You'll enjoy them. They're going to be performing some for you and giving some. Uh, definite accordion centric tips for your plan that you can pick up and use and, and increase your, your uh, style and your technical ability. And what I want to ask you is go out, find a hundred of your favorite friends, especially if they're accordion players and get them back here with you. We'll have a great time. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you, everybody. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Look at this little thing. Look at it. Look at that. Look at those, those are gold sparkly keys. I've had this thing reworked. It's a jewel. It, it, it's, a, it's an octave lower than the normal uh, tw uh, 12 bass accordion. It's an octave lower, the whole thing is. So wow. uh, yeah, and you can get a lot of sound. That's something I would tell people. Don't shy away from the small accordions. Learn to play the bigger ones, but what you can do with the small ones, you can pump the sound out. You can really manipulate these bellows and you can play louder than you can with the bigger accordions. So don't, even though there's only 12 little things here and there's all, there's just a lot, two, a little over two octaves generally, you can do a lot with them. And if you're playing with the band, you can really learn a lot about projecting. So I, I don't, I don't tell anybody to shy away from the small ones. I think every accordion player should have one on stage for those moments when you have to be heard. <laughs> That's a great tip. I know a lot of people will appreciate that. So we're going to shut off for right now. Thank you, everybody. And I just want to say be well and keep squeezing out there. Thank you, Terry. You're a Thank great you, guy. Bro. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.